Cool. So uh, my name is Zeal. This is my teammate Zoltan. Um, we are here today to talk to you about a little bit about how we run our containers at Facebook, uh, specifically about how we use uh, tools, open source tools, to build our container images. Um, the title of the slide is a little misleading. Uh, it was originally supposed to be getting, given by a different teammate, but he couldn't give it. Um, so we kind of restructured it um, to talk a little bit more about these open source tools that we use. Um, so first, we're going to go through a little bit of background on Tupperware, which is our um, container platform. Um, then we're going to talk, uh, Zoltan is going to talk about uh, Tupperware and then ButterFS and SystemD and how we use those within Tupperware um, and within our image build tool chain. And then I'm going to be talking about how we use Chef to kind of tie all these things together. Um, and finally, kind of wrap it up with um, some overview of how we bu uh, build these images. Hello. Hi, uh, I am Zoltan. Um, welcome. So let's talk about a uh, little bit about Tupperware and what it is. So Tupperware would be our containerization and scheduling system within Facebook that we use to run a lot of jobs. Uh, essentially, uh, the intent of this system is to manage resources, both on cluster and host level. Uh, we uh, we have a high granularity of uh, resource control. Mm, we want to run all of our jobs in isolated environments, so we make sure that uh, our jobs don't interfere with, with each other, and also for security purposes. Mm. Our resource control uh, go from cluster level to rack host uh, level, and then on the hosts we can also control memory, CPU, I.O., and other resource consumptions. Uh, we also support a lot of uh, things like uh, different styles of jobs, uh, restart and update policies, um, co-location parameters. So essentially, it gives a lot of flexibility on how our users want to uh, deploy and run their services. So this would be like a bird view uh, of uh, the architecture. So users will usually specify uh, a job configuration, which is a domain-specific language uh, a text file, uh, think something similar to Python. And uh, they put all the details they require, the binaries they want to run, and then they use some form of CLI to send it to our schedulers. Uh, schedulers have this concept of a job that is tied to this uh, configuration file. Mm, it will separate the configuration into two main pieces. Uh, one is that related to scheduling and location and the other is that related to the actual job that we have to execute. We will send the job-related details to the host themselves, where the host will be responsible uh, for running mm, the binary that the user has requested. Uh, the scheduler maintains a state of all tasks and uh, hosts, so in case of host failures or reallocations or rescheduling, we can move tasks around. and. Uh, all our binaries that we actually require to run uh, within our containers are fetched from our distributed package man management system. Uh, Tupperware provides both shared and private uh, pools for users. Uh, shared pools is where a lot of people that just launch their jobs and we collocate them with other random users' jobs. And then we have some specific users that require a set of pools because they want to have specific settings or they just want to have a dedicated set of resources, so we just carve them out for them and they can have their own domain there. Uh, you might ask why we don't use some existing industry solution. Uh, one of the main reasons is that when we started working on Tupperware, none of these were really readily available uh, for our scale. Uh, also, we want to achieve uh, high-level integration within Facebook systems so we can do a lot of uh, optimization and uh, efficiency improvements. Uh, why don't we use VMs? Well, the resource overhead is actually not worth it for us. Containerization provides uh, good enough isolation for most of our jobs since we control the binaries and the hosts. And also, it's much harder to debug issues in a VM environment, so we want to avoid all of that. So how did we build images previously? Um, we would create a fast system shoot. Uh, we would yum bootstrap inside of it. 
uh, then install some more packages, uh, install some custom configurations. Uh, we would replace an init system with BusyBox in it uh, for legacy reasons. Uh, and then we would bundle this into a tarball and distribute it as a package to the fleet. Building was done by a set of shell scripts. Uh, so, and we also had to pin uh, several versions of the packages, uh, which would cause problems from time to time. And uh, also, customization was a little bit hard due to these hacky scripts. So, once this golden image, uh, so to speak, uh, was deployed to the fleet, uh, when we would start up a task, we would download this shroot file. Uh, we would uh, launch the container uh, with a form of LXC, and then we would perform further customization for the customer. Uh, since we had only one gold image, golden image, uh, every customer would have to uh, configure their own container environment, which would include like installing more YAM packages and doing more YAM configuration. And then finally, we would uh, launch the main process inside of the container. So the, this customization phase, phase actually uh, also had, beyond installing packages, a pre-run command, which was effectively a shell command that we would execute uh, in the container before we start up the final uh, command to run. Uh, the packages uh, were pinned to uh, the version when the job was first started, uh, which would cause some interesting bugs from time to time. Uh, we would install via YAM uh, on every start. And in fact, if you had multiple containers running on the same host or the same type, we would install into all of them. So that was a bit IO uh, heavy. Uh, the pre-run command uh, was intended for simple stuff like, oh, let's do some chmod or let's run some background service or something like that. Uh, but it was never really intended for complicated stuff. Uh, of course, our users are very resourceful, so they started working around this and implementing effectively bash scripts in this pre-run command with ampersand ampersand and uh, or writing configuration files, and this was really not okay because it was really, really hard to debug and really, really hard to find to pin down the actual issue within this complex pre-run command. So the drawbacks of the old system were effectively that we had this one single golden image that someone had to update with a list of hacky scripts. Then once it was done, it had to be deployed to the entire fleet. There was like no customization per tier or anything like that. Uh, we didn't really apply any customer uh, or application specific customizations. Uh, Pre-run command is awful. And uh, the task setup was repeated every single time when a task was run. So the solution for this is uh, using some modern tools to actually achieve something better. So what do we want to achieve? So we wanted to achieve a type of uh, image build system uh, where we can build uh, both uh, generic and customer specific images. And this would allow us uh, to provide with more flexibility, uh, with more control. And also we want to have reproducible builds. We wanted to have uh, transparency so we can actually understand what's happening in these images. And uh, we, Imagine this layering system where you can build uh, uh, customly defined layers on top of each other, and then we can ship those to the fleet uh, as required. So ButterFS, uh, it's a next generation file system. Uh, I would say most of you are familiar with it, but if not, think of similar to ZFS. Uh, it has a lot of features, but the main features that we utilize to achieve our goals is the copy and write feature, the subvolumes, uh, the snapshots, which are a special type of subvolumes, uh, quotas, and the advanced C groups IO control. Uh, read only and read write snapshots are actually also really important to produce immutable base images, but provide with a read write environment to any of the actually running tasks. So, ButterFS gives us a uh, much lower disk space usage since we can share a lot of uh, base data. Uh, it obviously improves our IO disk usage. 
uh, since uh, we have to write simply less. Uh, uh, this data caching uh, improves our startup times since we, once a task is running, we only hit cache. Uh, and we can independently actually version layers with this. And we can also provide a different update schedule for these layers, which is really important when upgrading the base system or customer specific uh, stuff. For example, imagine a customer wants to build their package or their layer once a day or maybe multiple times a day, then we can uh, accommodate them without actually having to rebuild the whole stack of the images. So how does it work? Uh, imagine you want to launch a task on a virgin host. What you would do is we will pre-ship your base OS onto the host, so it's always already there, it's always the latest, it's always up to date with the security patches. Uh, we also pre-ship the Facebook customization. Uh, we install SSH, search, some other fancy things, firewall, you name it. Uh, this is like the standard image that everyone has to build off or run off. And then comes the customer and says like, oh, please launch my task which has all these binaries and configurations in it. So we just ship uh, a layer. Uh, we use bot references send and receive, the, which are effectively binary diffs uh, of the file system to build, rebuild his layer. And then uh, we create a read-write snapshot from all this read-only uh, stack to launch their task. Uh, if the user chooses to run more tasks, then we just create yet another uh, snapshot, which is also read write launch another task. If we happen to collocate another user's custom job, we can just apply another layer diff and another task snapshot to run. And if the user has a simple binary that doesn't require any customization, uh, they just want to like, fire and forget their binary, we can do that too. Just create a snapshot, put their binary in, and run. <laughs> This gives us a lot of flexibility on how we ship and build these images. And uh, it makes the system not only more efficient, but gives us modern tools to work with and uh, tools that are familiar to most of the engineers. So ButterFS will do all the layering for us. Like We don't really have to implement anything. It's just done magically in the kernel. Uh, diff, send, and receive will optimize also our bandwidth within the fleet. Since we don't have to sp uh, ship all these huge images all the time, we just ship the specific binary diff layer that is required by, you by the user. Uh, system the Nspawn uh, is the tool that we use both to build and run the images. Uh, we actually also run system D in it inside of our containers, so we are technically open to the pod concept. Uh, it's really in easy to integrate with our existing tools. Uh, it just works. Uh, we build once and then ship everywhere. I think the only th problem we had with Anspawn so far, and that is because we use it directly, uh, is that it doesn't set up C groups for us, uh, which we require to control uh, resources. With um, and uh, Zeal will now talk about how we customize our containers further. Cool. Uh, there. Um, so, of course, we we use Chef uh, at Facebook. Um, we've been um, might be a little bit uh, unclear why we're using Chef to build these images. Um, there are a few reasons why we do this. Um, the first is that we have a lot of familiarity with Chef and how it works, and we have a lot of tools um, and experience using Chef um, that make it really easy to work with, not just for the, the teams that are building uh, like Tupperware and all, uh, the operating system layer, um, but also for um, application engineers who are using these tools um, to configure their own systems. They, they already kind of know how Chef works and um, know all the caveats for using it. Um, so using it to build images is something they're already familiar with. Um, we also have a good relationship with the Chef Upstream community. Um, we do a lot of work with them to make sure that um, we can continue to use Chef as it changes. Um, and we wanted, we knew that if we ran into any problems uh, rolling out the images across the fleet um, that were specific to Chef, we could discuss this with the open source community um, and either get those fi issues fixed or fix how we're using Chef, whatever is appropriate. Um, so uh, first, a few notes about Chef uh, generally at Facebook, um, not specific to images. Um, so we use uh, Chef APIs a little bit differently than, than most people. Um, uh, open source uh, 
like most of the the Chef built-in APIs use resources and providers to implement whatever thing you want to interact with on the system. Um, a lot of our APIs, uh, many of our APIs are built in this way uh, for one reason or another, um, but a lot of our APIs aren't built this way. Um, they use uh, an attribute instead. Um, so if you're not familiar with Chef, um, basically you can attach um, attributes to a Chef node that just represent data. Um, and then we have Chef, uh, we've written Chef code that will go through these attributes that you attach to the node and implement whatever um, they, they do. Um, and so an example of this, um, so on the top is a fictional resource that I have made up as an example. On the bottom is an open source cookbook that we provide. Um, there's a link, uh, well, it's on our GitHub page um, that will set up a systemd timer for you. Um, so if you're using something like this top resource um, to do this, um, this of course would just go in and lay down a systemd unit file, uh, well, two unit files. First, a service, and then a timer job that will kick off that service using um, the options that you've provided. Um, the disadvantage of doing this is when you remove that timer sometime in the future, you need to remember to delete both of the unit files, uh, or maybe the systemd timer implements a delete action. Um, but either way, you need to remember to have your chef code execute that for some period of time afterwards to make sure that that job is deleted. Um, with the attribute API model we have here, um, you can uh, attach something to the node attribute and make sure that the FB timers cookbooks default recipe runs, and it will just enforce that whatever is attached to the node object is all on disk. And anything that's on disk that doesn't match what's in the node attribute will just be deleted. Um, so you, uh, in a chef recipe that has this, you can literally just delete these four lines, and then it'll disappear off the system as well. Um, and so that's the primary advantage we get from doing this. Uh, we also have a script for running Chef. Um, it does a lot of uh, nice things like uh, manages log files for Chef, uh, manages log files. Um, it's also platform independent. We run it on Windows and OS X and Linux uh, within Facebook. Um, it's also open source. It's on GitHub. Um, and it has hooks that will allow for extending it. Um, and we've used these hooks extensively to um, use this, be able to use this same script in different environments where we run Chef, like on bare metal CentOS hosts, um, or on Windows VMs, or inside Tupperware images. Um, so uh, as far as how the Chef code actually is used for images, um, the first thing we do is we take a basically a snapshot of our version control system where we store our Chef code. Um, so that Chef code is then versioned and, and deployed as a package. Um, and since it's got a version, you can deploy that with your application. So when your application changes and you need to change the config file for it, you can bundle those two changes at the same time um, in your image. Um, this also allows for really e reproducible builds. So, so you can just roll back the package version to get the old version of the Chef code. Um, this is something we can do for images, but we don't do this at all for Chef hosts. Um, for hosts, we merely go forward in time, uh, and we never, ever go backwards. Um, this is a little bit of an anti-pattern for Chef uh, for images, um, but we find it works really well for managing uh, more application-centric stuff. Um, we also uh, enable a feature called attribute injection. Um, basically, the way this works is um, we have a chef cuddle hook that will scan a directory on disk um, and use uh, JSON files that are present in that directory for defining node attributes. Um, chef client already has the dash dash JSON attributes option, which does this, um, but we do a little bit of extra stuff to take all of the JSON files and merge them uh, in a consistent way. So you get a single JSON file that you can then pass to JSON attributes. Um, so uh, since we also use uh, attribute APIs for many of our Chef APIs, this allows you to really easily configure how Chef works by just dropping a JSON file on disk. Um, and so other systems that want to inform Chef what it should do can do so just by dropping a JSON file on disk. They don't have to generate Ruby code. Um, which is pretty easy to use. Um, and our, I, as a matter of fact, our uh, build tool chain for images uses this to configure the run list for the chef run to tailor what chef code gets run. Um, so we also have a tool at Facebook called Taste Tester. Um, Taste Tester is a chef testing framework. Um, we use it extensively at Facebook, and it's also open source. Um, 
we've integrated it into our uh, build tool chain for images. Um, so if you want to, you can invoke an image build um, in a sort of test mode, which will never produce an image because we don't want people manually mucking with their images. We want everything um, to be defined in source control that actually produces a production image. Um, but if you just want to test out your chef code, uh, you can run an image build in this development environment, and it will taste test the image uh, build context. Um, and then whatever changes you make in your version control repository are synced into the image automatically. Um, and this allows for really easy development of the images. Um, so one thing we've done to uh, kind of tailor uh, how this image build process works uh, is we've included a systemd uh, unit called task init dot target. Um, the way this works is um, the chef will run during image build time and, and drop off this task in it.target. Um, then any application-specific chef code that needs to run can run and install their own systemd units, um, whatever the application needs. And any service that gets wanted by or has this wanted by line in their unit um, will get included during task startup. Um, so um, during image build, we install this and install whatever units. And then sometime later, it'll get run on a host. And we will uh, basically uh, system cuddle start task in it.target, which will immediately start all of the um, unit files that are wanted by taskinet.target. Um, so this basically replaces the pre-run command. Any daemons that you need to run in the background or configuration items you need to do at runtime, you can set them up as systemd units at build time, and then they'll get run at task startup. Um, and since they're run by systemd, you get a really nice graph of like which ones failed and which ones didn't. You get standard output and standard error from all the jobs. Um, it's really easy to use this way, um, which is night and day compared to the pre-run command we had previously. Um, so uh, the way we actually build these images now, um, so the configuration for the images um, for a, um, yeah, so the configuration for the images, um, basically we do package installation via yum. Um, if you need to do more advanced configuration for your application specific image, you, you do that with Chef. Um, we also uh, use systemd for um, both the task in it um, and other related tasks. Um, and we also allow, since, since you can enable task startup time uh, units, you can also enable chef at runtime if you want to like run chef um, at runtime and have it catch up the systems uh, since there might have been some time passed between build time and runtime. Um, so <clears throat> so uh, for images, um, we, we also have a build system to build these images. Um, we do these rebuilds based on changes in our source control repository. So if something changes in the chef code or in the application code, we can automatically trigger a new build of whatever images depend on that. Um, they also build on a schedule. So if something isn't rebuilt, they get, uh, it gets rebuilt automatically to make sure everything's kind of up to date. Um, but we also only ship new images if there are changes. Um, I think, um, uh, so, uh, we basically do this by checking um, the source control for what has changed and what uh, what source control files get mapped to which files in the images. Um, and um, since we have ButterFS, we can ship binary diffs rather than the whole image. Um, so that stack of images you saw earlier, we only need to ship whichever layer changed. We don't need to ship the whole stack. Um, and we're also working on building uh, an automatic build and test validation framework for this as well. Um, so the end result, um, to build a truth image now, um, we, instead of creating just a, a bare truth, we create a ButterFS file system, um, and uh, we basically call yum bootstrap inside it. Um, this is for the CentOS layer. Um, if uh, at higher levels, we don't do the yum bootstrap, because that was already done in the lower level, um, but instead we'll customize it with Chef. Um, we don't need to do the um, package installation or custom configs, and we don't install BusyBox as sbin init anymore. Um, instead, we can just uh, do customizations with Chef, and whatever Chef is configured to do, it will uh, enforce that's true within the image. Uh, we bundle the resulting ButterFS uh, file system into a tarball and then distribute that through our package management system. 
So task startup now, um, basically you download whatever image the job is configured for. Um, we launch it with systemd and spawn. Um, we don't do any setup inside the container anymore. Instead, we start that task init.target that I mentioned earlier. Um, and once that has completed successfully, we launch the main process inside the container, whatever that task is configured to run, a database or web server or whatever. Um, so task configuration now doesn't, no longer has a packages or a pre-run command. Um, we don't need to do either of those customizations at runtime. Instead, the only thing it has is an image, um, what image it should, it should build on top of, and then the command. Um, and that's pretty much it. Um, so uh, we saw a lot of performance improvements when we started rolling this out. Um, ButterFS in particular gives us huge um, IO and um, disk usage um, uh, improvements. Um, and we were also able to reduce downtime during upgrades significantly when we made these changes. Um, since uh, you, you don't need to do these runtime customizations during startup, you can just um, lay down a ButterFS file system somewhere on your disk and start it immediately. Um, so some of the lessons that we learned doing this, um, systemd inspawn is uh, extremely easy to use and, uh, and very robust um, to changes. Um, we did have some issues when we were using it, but it was mostly because we misread the man pages. Um, so, um, but also, uh, ButterFS layering is really simple, um, and you can use it very easily. Um, it, uh, both systemd and ButterFS integrated very well with our internal tools. Um, uh, but also, um, we, well, we learned uh, basically like shell commands don't make good configuration management for things that are more complex than, uh, say, a simple command. Uh, once you start trying to make multiple commands run uh, together and make them reproducible and testable, uh, it becomes a nightmare very quickly. Um, also, in our container system, BusyBox doesn't really make a very good SBIN init. Um, it's just not built for the sort of scale that we're running at. So, questions? Um, yeah, I don't. Uh, at the back. Can you raise your hand? Uh, okay, sorry. Um, in the beginning, I saw that you're using systemd and spawn and systemd for Tupperware. Mm -hmm. I see that there, there's a lot of a lot in common, for example, with the rocket run, uh, container runtime. How, I mean, wasn't there, didn't you think about, okay, what was common between, or was, why wasn't this considered as an option, for example, to be used? Um, I don't, I don't know about rocket specifically. Um, systemd and Spawn kind of made an obvious choice because it was already installed on all of our machines. Um, and uh, we had already started using it in a few other cases, uh, which we didn't talk about. Um, but we already kind of had familiarity with systemd and spawn uh, from the get-go. Um, yeah. Yeah. Uh, hi, thanks for the talk. Mm -hmm. um, what version of PTRFS are you using in production now? Are you checking mainline or? So, uh, yeah, I can take that. So, um, we are actually using almost the latest. Uh, one of the reasons is that uh, uh, there were quite a few butterfest bugs in earlier kernel versions. I think uh, for us the recommended version is 4.6.15 or above. And uh, we actually uh, work with quite a few kernel developers, uh, also within the company and outside. And uh, we push all the fixes upstream. So if you use any recent mainline kernel, then all the butterfest fixes should be there for you. Okay, great. And another quick question. You were talking about using BTRFS send and receive for, uh, yeah, basically uh, exchanging the diffs. Are you pushing those into an object store like S3 or how are you getting those onto the production machines? Uh, so what we do is we, uh, when we build these images, we, we also get, uh, uh, with, uh, send all these layers as, as the diffs and we just package them up and we just piggyback on our package management system. So when you receive a request to like, oh, please run this task with this image, then what we do is we just follow the tree of uh, layers to the root and then we just fetch each of the layers and reconstruct it. And once it's on the host, uh, then we only fetch those layers that are actually 
different that and required for the new task. Yeah. Very cool. Thank you. Cool. Any more questions? Okay. Uh, thanks. Um, yeah.